Hello, this Dating the Old Testament video is on the subject of the activity of the scribes. Let me share my screen. This uh, topic of the activity of the scribes is a little different from the previous videos I've done, which talked about dating a particular book. And I'm going to get back and do some more of that, but it was necessary to do this first because it set a little bit of the groundwork for explaining some of the things that happened in the earlier books, which were written in the Old Testament. This could be called, in addition to just what the scribes did, it's a partial history of the text that we have. I think it's also just an interesting topic kind of on its own. And the best way to work it is to start with today and work backwards, because that way we can discuss first some things about which we can be completely certain. And as we move farther back in time, we, we become a little bit less certain. And in my last part is a little bit more speculative. And I'll try to remember to describe when I'm getting into more speculative, speculative ground. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And Hebrew text, which we have today, you can kind of look at it in two different ways. The one on the left there is a Torah, it's a Torah scroll in a synagogue. And the text there on the right is a Biblia Hebraica Stuttgart Tensia. If you order a Hebrew Bible or buy one at the bookstore, it'll be that Biblia Hebraica Stuttgart Tensia in some form or another. And the letters and the words in that book and in a Torah scroll are identical. The, the book on the right has some additional stuff that I'll talk to later, but the words in all of that are, are identical in the two. Now, this is a picture of the cover of the Leningrad Codex. It's the oldest complete Hebrew Old Testament. It dates to about 1008 AD, so it's a little over a thousand years old now. It's the source for the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. So if you buy one of those books on the Hebrew Bible on the internet, what you're getting is a transcribed copy, essentially a transcribed copy of the Leningrad Codex, which is over a thousand years old. This is what's called a Masoretic text. We'll talk more about the Masoretes in a minute, but you, if, if anybody's heard that term, you'll wanna know that if you've ever read the Old Testament, what you were reading was primarily a translation of a Masoretic text. Because any English language Bible will be translated mostly from a Masoretic text. Now, the Aleppo Codex is another complete Hebrew Old Testament, although it was partially burned, so they've lost a little bit of it in 1947. It is also a Masoretic text. The page here is a picture of a page from Deuteronomy. It's a similar date to the Leningrad Codex. I don't think they've got this one right down to the year, but it was around when the Crusaders came to uh, Jerusalem in 1099. So because the, uh, those codexes are, are the same Hebrew text that we have today, we can be quite sure that of course the text hasn't changed at all for a thousand years. And Going a thousand years back is interesting because it goes back to actually the time before the Gutenberg Bible or the invention of the printing press. We can be certain that the text hasn't changed uh, in that time period. Now let's talk about the Masoretes a little bit. The Masoretes were a group of Jewish scribes who were active from the time from about 500 to 1000 AD. They copied the Old Testament, but in addition to copying it, they developed a system of vowel points to place around the text to aid in pronunciation. You see, the Hebrew language consists initially of a group of letters which are all consonants. And so the Hebrew scriptures were written first in all consonants. If you have consonants only, uh, you can lose the sound of it a little bit. And so they developed points to place around the text to help with the pronunciation. And they also added many textual notes and miscellaneous information. It's a big topic. And essentially they standardized the text. So what 
what was the outcome of all their work is really called a Masoretic text. On the internet, you may have seen something that is a little bit conspiracy theory-like that says that the, uh, the Masoretes or scribes, which actually altered the text or something like that, perhaps in an anti-Christian fashion. That's nonsense and Christians shouldn't traffic in that kind of thing. Like I said, if you've ever read the Old Testament, you were reading a translation of a Masoretic text. This is a, a bit of Hebrew script here, and it says, it's from Genesis 1, it says, and God said, let the waters be gathered. And so it's a, a snippet of uh, Genesis 1. And the part that's in black there, those are the letters. So those are what you would see in a Torah scroll in a synagogue today, and those are what was in the text as it was originally written. Those are in black. Now, the red marks are little dots above and below mostly, and they indicate what the vowel sounds were supposed to be. And as you see, the Masoretes devised a way to put these dots into the text in such a way that it didn't change any letters, it didn't even change the spacing between the letters. It's just there to allow you to know what the vowel sounds are supposed to be. And the blue marks are cantillation marks that tell you how to chant things. So the Masoretes not only put those marks in there, but they had textual notes as well. And they were so scrupulous and careful about copying things that they did things like copy letters. The final Masoretic notes at the end of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, tell you how many chapters were in the Torah, how many verses, how many words. And the last thing it says is the total number of letters in the Torah was 304,805. So they actually counted the letters to make sure they didn't miss any. So because they were so careful about it, I think we can faithfully say that if you roll all the way back to the time when the Masoretes got a hold of the text, about 500 AD up until today, once again, the text hasn't really changed since that time. So let's talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're a little older than that. They date from about 250 BC to 68 AD. About 202 of them are books of the Bible. There's quite a few other Dead Sea Scrolls and how exactly you count a book of the Bible, it can depend. I'm counting a, a few Greek translations that have shown up in the Dead Sea Scrolls as, as books of the Bible too. But of that group, about 35% of them are what can be called proto-Masoretic texts. That's proto-Masoretic texts in the sense of the consonants match the later Masoretic text. 35% is a plurality of the biblical Dead Sea Scrolls. The rest, a few are similar to the Septuagint. Some have a lot more vowel letters. I'll talk about that later. And they're kind of an electric, eclectic group. But the, um, the plurality, the largest grouping, so to speak, are proto-Masoretic texts. And this is important. Those texts actually exhibit an older pedigree than the other scrolls. It's older in the sense that it has fewer of what we would call vowel letters. Now I need to explain that a little bit. I already mentioned that in Hebrew, the alphabet was entirely consonantal, but even before the Masoretes came along, there was a realization that that was a little bit problematic to have no vowel sounds. And so, during the biblical time period, uh, they decided to, that they could let about three letters occasionally double as a vowel sound. They would be the letters that would produce something like a long E or a long O sound. So for example, the word for God is Elohim. And in the early part of the Bible and in the later part of the Old Testament, it's spelled like it is there below those are identical. But by the time you get to the Dead Sea Scroll time period and on into modern Hebrew, they spell it a little bit differently. If you can see that extra symbol in there, that's the letter Vav, but it doubles as a long O sound as in Elohim. So 
later on, you know, they, they added these extra letters to help with the pronunciation. But the earlier time period when the Bible was written, they didn't use that letter in the word Elohim. So a lot of other Dead Sea Scrolls have that, but the proto-Masoretic texts don't. So that's what I mean when I say that they illustrate an older spelling pattern than some of the other scrolls. Another example is the word David. In Hebrew, it would be pronounced David, and those are three Hebrew letters, D, V, and D. But in the later books in the, well, that's the earlier books in the Bible, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, and so on. But in the later books, like first and second Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah and so on, it's spelled with an extra letter there. So it's really the equivalent of D, V, Y, D. And of course, later on in the Dead Sea Scroll time period, it's spelled that same way too. So that's an example of how sometimes you can distinguish between the earlier books in the Bible from the later books in the Bible because the trend throughout history was initially Hebrew was written with no vowel letters. And then as time went on, they, they began to add them. And to, to where finally in the latest uh, instance of Hebrew, they have vowel letters every time they possibly can. So if you go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, that kind of takes us back in time to a little bit before the time of Christ, where we can be very confident that the text didn't really change any significant amount at all uh, from what it is today till, till before the time of Christ. Now, we don't have any text older than the Dead Sea Scrolls that we can look at. So to go back a little bit farther than that, I'm going to use a different technique. And here, you remember I said, I'm going to move a little bit from where we could be pretty certain about things to where we can become a little less certain. And this is where we begin to be a little less certain. But still, I think this is a pretty compelling case. Here, I've got two passages of scripture side by side. One is Psalms 105 verses 1 through 15. And one is 1 Chronicles 16, verses 8 through 22. And if you compare them, they are essentially identical. If you look down near the bottom in verse 6, there's a word that's different. Verse 6 of Psalm 105 says, O offspring of Abraham. And then the parallel passage in Chronicles says, O offspring of Israel. So there you have one word that's different. Now, you may notice above that there's a few words there that are in green. Green means that something is different between the two texts that didn't affect the translation at all. Usually that's going to be spelling. In other words, the words were not spelled the same way. And that's because in one of the passages it would use a vowel letter and the other passages it wouldn't use a vowel letter, but it doesn't change the meaning at all. This is the next a few verses from those two passages, you can see one says he remembers and the other says remember. And there's a green word down there at the bottom. And then this last page that I was going to show you is one says when they were few in number and the other says when you were few in number. Well, so that's 15 verses um, of a post-exilic psalm that the exile was 586 BC. So this is one of the later Psalms. It wasn't a Psalm written by David. And First Chronicles was one of the later books of the Old Testament, about 400 BC. And those two passages are nearly identical. Even as far as most of the words were even spelled the same way. And with spelling being kind of optional as far as, far as how you could spell things in that period of time, the fact that even the spelling is usually identical tends to indicate that to get identical spelling, you kind of had to copy things mostly letter for letter. And the time span from Second Chronicles to the time we get to the Masoretes was about 900 years. So there you have two different passages being copied independently for 900 years, and they're still practically identical. I think this can give us good confidence that the post-exilic scribes used extreme care when they were copying the scriptures. They usually copied letter by letter. They didn't even update the spelling in that time period to reflect the more modern spelling period. They 
they kept it in, to use the more archaic spelling, which didn't have too many vowel letters. Now let's, th this shows the time frame of the scribes and I've backed it all the way up to about 400 BC, which indicates that that whole time period from then till now, I think we can have some confidence that the uh, scripture of the Hebrew Bible has been not significantly changed much at all. But now I'm gonna alter the story a little bit. Let's compare two passages that are also identical. One is from Isaiah two, and then on the right side, you have Micah four. Now on this one, there's a little bit more green and red on there. It's still not very much, Mostly on the switches seem to have switched the words people and peoples and nations, but there is more green and red in this section than there was in the previous one. No, no question that there's more. And so this, these are pre-exilic texts. This is older. These go back to about 700 BC. So with more differences in the previous examples, that I think gives us a little bit of a different picture here. It, it shows that um, maybe before the exile, before the destruction of Jerusalem, they were a little bit more free as far as how they recorded and updated the text. Maybe they weren't quite as rigorous about doing, say, letter for letter translations. Let's back up one more time and, and see another example. This is a comparison of 2 Samuel 22 and Psalm 18. These are also matching passages and the Psalm is a Psalm of David, which means that you would wanna date it, David's life to about 1000 BC. If you look at this, it's really a lot different. It has whole different uh, clauses in there. There's a fair amount of green and there's a fair amount of red. I've only done two pages, but this is a long psalm, and you can, if you're interested, you can take it as a homework assignment, set the two side by side, and you'll see that there's lots of differences. They, are, they clearly match, but there's a lot of differences. So what, what does this mean? Well, this is an older passage. Psalm of David goes back 1,000 to 1,000 BC, so this would be the oldest comparison we've looked at yet. There are many more differences than the previous examples. And interestingly, sometimes the differences are related to language changes that took place over time. You know, languages don't stay the same over time. Meanings of words change, grammar changes and whatnot. So let's like look, for example, at this Psalm 18, the very first clause there said, I love you, O Lord, my strength. But that isn't in 2 Samuel 22. Why? Well, we can't know for sure. Like I said, I'm getting a little bit more into speculative ground now, but the word for love in Psalm 18 is not the normal Hebrew word for love. It's a word that usually has the connotation for showing compassion, like a mother having compassionate love for her infant child. But if you, if that later on, if that's what it means, if that doesn't seem to be an entirely appropriate word for loving the Lord. So maybe that's why Psalm 22 left it out. I mean, Samuel 22 left it out. Um, maybe back at the time that it was written by David, the word might have had a little bit of a different connotation that wasn't a problem, but later on, maybe it kind of did become a problem. So some of the other changes also in Psalm 18 and 2 Samuel 22 also seem to be related to one being a little bit older Hebrew than the other. That's just one example. So this is kind of evidence that the pre-exilic scribes, the earlier ones, would be a little bit more free in updating archaic language. So here uh, I've drawn a, a yellow bar which shows that going back prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, before the exile, going all the way back to the time of Moses, they may have been a little bit more free in updating the scriptures than they were later on. Why would that have been? Why would they have changed? Well, I believe it, it goes with what happened in 586 BC. 
when Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, the house of David, the Davidic monarchy, which had so many promises associated with them, it was destroyed. Their altars, their sacrifice, their way they practiced their religion, it was all destroyed. They were carried off into exile, they had no more nation. What did they have? Well, really all that they had left was they had some holy books, they had some scriptures. And when that happened, I think those books became even more holy than they were before. And so the practice of transcribing and copying them became a much more rigorous and careful process than it might have been before. There's some evidence before the exile that they were pretty um, loose about that. You know, in the time of Josiah, they just uncovered a book of the law in the temple that apparently nobody had read for ages. And, uh, so they, they may not have taken the books quite so seriously before the destruction of Jerusalem. But here's a little bit of a wrinkle on that. There are some ancient songs and some other ancient poems in the Bible where they, the language is very different from ancient prose and later poetry. There's different grammar that's probably older and different vocabulary. And this is, when I talk about ancient songs, I'm talking about things like in Exodus 15, the song of uh, Moses, the horse and rider song. I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider thrown into the sea. It's a song or a, a poem, but if you try to read it, the grammar and the vocabulary is so different from the prose that surrounded it that you, you almost feel like you're reading a different language. Well, why, why would that be? Why would you have uh, the, the song or, or a poem showing more signs of antiquity than the prose which surrounds it? Well, let me give you an example. See if you can complete this sentence, the song. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his cap and called it, what did he call it? He called it macaroni. So everybody knew that. But probably most people listening to this video don't know what it means. Macaroni, the macaroni is a, a pasta that we eat with cheese, but that's not what Yankee Doodle meant. That's not what the song, Yankee Doodle didn't think he was pasta. That's not what the song meant. That's an archaic word. It actually meant somebody who thinks he's really fancy or a dandy, and it's kind of a derogatory way of saying it. So why don't we bring the language up to date? Well, you can't, you can't change a song. Everybody knows the song and it's kind of like impossible to change a song. Come thou fount of every blessing. That has archaic language, but we're not gonna change it to come you fountain. It would mess the whole song up. The same thing happens with the songs in the Bible. The scribes can't update a song without messing it up. Now the spelling can still be updated because that doesn't affect anything, doesn't affect the, the meter or the meaning, but you can't change the words in a song. So here we have a timeline for ancient songs like Exodus 15 or Judges 5, the song of Deborah. Those are very, very old, but they may not have been updated nearly so much as the prose passages that are immediately before and after them. So when you look at the older books in the Old Testament, we have a mixed bag. The pre-exilic scribes probably updated the prose more freely to bring the language up to date. And geography. An example would be Genesis 14, 14, where Abraham is pursuing after the, the kings that had kidnapped, uh, that attacked Sodom and Gomorrah and, and carried off his nephew Lot. And Genesis 14, 14 says he pursued them as far as Dan. Well, Dan is a city on the far northern border of Israel, but Dan was named after the tribe of Dan and that was Abraham's great-grandson that wasn't even born when Genesis 14, 14 
was written. And, and they didn't even conquer that city of Dan until the time of the judges, which was like 800 years later. So was it wrong of the scribes? I don't want it to sound like it was wrong of the scribes to update that geography. In fact, they probably did a good deed because if there was a Canaanite city there, nobody in the later people of Israel would even know what it meant when it said that Abraham chased him as far as some name of some city, which has been gone for 800 years. But they knew what Dan was. And so in some cases, the pre-exilic scribes would also update things like geography. So as a result of that kind of update, the pre-exilic text in the Bible, whether you're reading Genesis or 2 Kings, they all look a lot, not exactly, but they look a lot like biblical Hebrew did near the time of the exile. Exceptions, there are a few things not updated, like some songs and poems, they don't show that same sort of update. Also names, uh, some of the names, particularly in Genesis, they're clearly supposed to have a particular meaning like Abraham is supposed to mean father of a multitude, but that doesn't exactly match the way you would say father of a multitude in Hebrew, in, in later Hebrew. And there are a lot of names like that, but you can't change a name so some of the things in the languages like that have stayed the same. So anyway, that's just a discussion of how I think that the, uh, the activity of the scribes worked. I think that starting with about the time of the exile, we have pretty near a letter for letter copy of what the Bible was like at that time, but going back to the before the exile, we have a little bit of a case where it was been updated a little bit more freely. Of course, this is a very large topic and you can read more about it from my, uh, in my book, Dating the Old Testament, if anybody's interested in that subject any further. And so thank you for watching and I will uh, post another uh, video in about a week or so.